Hello, hello, this is BSJ, and this video is going to be a summary of after about a week of playing 7.00 of what I believe to be like the meta breakdown of the patch and what I think the implications of the patch are going to be, what heroes are going to be strong, what kind of play styles are going to be strong. And keep in mind that this is going to repeat some of the stuff that I had in other, my other game league videos. But I feel like some of this stuff needs to be repeated, and I feel like this is going to be the video that I need to make to summarize, culminize all of my stuff into one video. So the first thing I want to talk about is the patch. And I'm not going to look at like the specifics of the patch. I've already talked about, you know, reviewed a little of the patch notes and everything like that. What I want to look at is like the perspective of the patch, like conceptually. And this is this is a groundbreaking patch, uh, especially for me. I mean, I didn't play Dota 1 or anything, but I'm under the impression that this is the first patch that, you know, I've, since I've played Dota 2, it 100% is. But this is the first patch in history that didn't really change many heroes, meaning like, yeah, a few heroes were nerfed, a few heroes were buffed, a few heroes were reworked, but the primary patch was just change. There was very little buffs, very little nerfs. It was just change. And that's like the really biggest thing I want to emphasize um, going into this video is that like, yeah, there were a few tweaks on heroes, there are a few tweaks here and there, but the overall is just a rule change. And so what I want to look at that, and the reason why I'm emphasizing that again, is that rather than like thinking like, you know, looking at the hero balances, looking at the talent trees and stuff like that, which do matter, I think the best way to first approach this patch conceptually is to look at the overall rule changes of the game and how that would affect every specific hero. Like if you really like playing a certain hero, ask yourself, how these rules are going to affect that hero. So what I'm going to now ask you and ask myself is, what are these changes? Like, what changes should we highlight? So these are the ones that I really think are the most important. There's obviously a bunch of little ones, along with like leveling and stuff like that. But these are the ones that I definitely think are the most impactful. So the first one is neutral camps spawn every other minute. So obviously you can just say that's in the patch notes. But what does that mean? That means that even though they added two camps on each side of the map, they added an extra ancients and they added an extra medium camp, that means that there's just less farm, right? It's it's like approximately, you know, a little over 50, maybe 60% of farm that there used to be, you know, in the, before 7.00. That hurts heroes that want to flash farm the map. That hurts heroes that, you know, move around the map killing jungle creeps at a, like a rapid pace. That hurts heroes that just want to farm. Like, that's the first thing I think of. The next thing is it benefits heroes that our mobility because they want to move but they don't necessarily need to kill the camps very fast so heroes that uh formerly you know weren't the best at flash farming are kind of on a closer edge to those like you know anti-mage and sven and stuff like that that just cleared through the jungle rapidly and i think that that's really important is it's not like dota is a game of fine balance right so if you have a hero that does a specific job well in this case farming camps very fast and moving around the map very rapidly that got nerfed to kill camps really fast right and heroes that don't rely on that mechanic got innately buffed. So those are the kind of things I'm going to look at at all these changes. So that's the first one, neutral camps. Think about the heroes that benefit from that and the heroes that don't lose out from it. So that's a big change. Like the heroes that didn't lose out technically got buffed. So the next change I want to look at is bounty runes, right? So when I look at bounty runes is they basically supplemented a lot of the missing farm on the map for bounty runes. Uh, obviously, it's still not as much, but what that means is a lot about the map is map control, like being able to just take the bounty runes. The bounty runes doesn't require anything but being there, right? So heroes that may be high mobility, but low, you know, clearing, meaning they, didn't, they don't kill camps very fast, benefit from this bounty rune change. Also, maybe heroes that wouldn't have previously bought a bottle as their source of regen may buy a bottle as a source of regen, and that would be plenty enough for them to farm. That's the kind of thing I'm looking at. And heroes that don't really benefit from moving around the map a lot, don't gain anything from this change. So it's really like heroes that want map control, heroes that are fast, high move speed heroes, heroes, like I said, that didn't clear a lot of camps. Their farm is raised much more in relative to heroes that did clear camps very fast just from the bounty runes around the map. So that's another balance change to consider. I think of heroes like Legion Commander, like Ursa, heroes that are really fast, want to run around the map, but they didn't clear stacks, they didn't clear camps really fast. And those are the kind of heroes that just get innately buffed by that kind of change. So the next one is shrines every five minutes. And so the first thing I'm going to look at is the positioning of the shrines. You know, on both sides, one of them on the Radiant and the Dire is really close to the mid lane. So a lot of times the mid lane can reliably use that shrine. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the mid lane every game, but I definitely think that in your pubs you should try to communicate. And I think that that shrine, especially in competitive, is just going to be delegated to the mid lane. Um, I think it could be, you know, cleverly used such that like a support like a Skyrath, instead of killing himself after he blows all of his mana, would, you know, TP to that shrine at the same time that the mid needs to use it. 
and then they could both use it, kind of stuff like that. But the thing is, you have to think about shrines, right? If they offer you a, basically a free regen rune, right? But at the same time, they only offer a flat amount of mana and a flat amount of health. So that flat amount of mana is a full mana pool for heroes like, you know, agi casters and strength casters. But a lot of int heroes that start, you know, with four or 500 mana don't get full mana from the shrines. So even though those heroes can definitely still utilize the shrines, the heroes that previously had low mana pools and like medium cost abilities, once again, I think of heroes like Ursa and Legion, you know, Slardar, heroes like they had like 75 to 100 mana cost nukes that are very effective for their mana cost. But in previous patches, their main limitation was mana pool. Like they only have like, you know, base 300 mana pool or less. So when I look at those heroes, I think those heroes benefited much more from shrines. So the first one goes to mid lane. So maybe some of those heroes could be more viable mid. Maybe they could skip a bottle. But other heroes that like didn't necessarily rely on spamming their abilities, you know, something that can't really afford to spam abilities. The first one I think of in my hero pool is Slark. That's not really a hero that you just want to dump all your mana because most of your mana cost comes from dark pack spamming and that hurts you. So that's like a hero that, in, for instance, doesn't benefit from shrines. So then the next step is the other two shrines, one on each side, is that both of them are located to near the off lanes. Like one of them is on the Radiant off lane and one of them is on the Dire off lane. And so when I look at that, I think of heroes that want to be carries that can go in the off lane, meaning like they're just high move speed, they're high durability, they're high pressure, like they are very strong in lane. And those are the heroes. And then I think of also combining that with heroes that benefit from the shrine. And that's why I've been spamming Ursa, Legion Commander, and Slardar in the offlane as one position heroes, because those heroes are able to reliably dump their resources in mana and health without dying very, like they have high durability, so they're not likely to die doing so. And those are the kind of heroes that I love in the offlane right now as carries. And that's why I like playing the carry in the offlane. And so that's like thinking of the implication of heroes. And once again, every hero benefits from the shrine, right? But think of it as a flat mana gain, flat health gain, and what heroes can reliably dump a lot of resources at the start of the lane. And those are basically heroes with low cooldowns, like medium mana cost abilities that were previously only limited by the fact that they had a low mana pool to use them. So that's like another huge deal. Once again, I'm just going to repeat that you got to think about the heroes that benefit from these changes more than others or benefit less from these changes. Those are the heroes that are technically weaker now. So. I'm going to move on from that, but I'm going to make a very specific video about that in the use of shrines. And that's something that I think shrines are one of the most game-breaking changes in the history of Dota. And their effect on laning stage is massive. And I'm going to be making numerous videos on that. So the next one to consider, and pretty much the last one, is item changes. And I've talked about item changes in my previous video on Game League. But I want to look at like what they do to the heroes. I want you to think about it that way, right? So the main ones I'm going to talk about is Helm of the Dominator change. Quelling Blade change, as well as Iron Talon, and also just the change to Regen. And what I mean by that is you're allowed to salve, clarity, and bottle through neutral camps. So how I look at these things, so first off the Dominator, right, I think is the most OP item in the game. I want to say straight off the bat, in terms of meta breaking, that because of all the farm nerfs, that I believe that this game is going to be all about grouping, all about pressuring towers, not necessarily five man grouping, but like pressuring towers is two or three consistently. I don't think you're going to be farming a lot on your own. I don't think this benefits heroes like Morphling and Anti-Mage, those split pushing farmers that take time to come online. I think if you just run at people with a tower pusher and a high pressure carrier support, meaning like if the tower pushes a carrier or the tower pushes a support and vice versa, that's just the meta that this is going to form into. And an item like Helm of the Dominator is so incredible for this because it gives eight HP regen aura for 1800 gold. If you really think of that, like, in a vacuum, that's disgusting, right? Um, not only that, you like, I've dominated Seder Creeps, and that gives you 14 health regen. Imagine taking a fight consistently in a lane contested where you have active Tranquil Boot regen. And that's insane amount of regen for you and your team. It's an aura, right? And then there's just so many beneficial creeps, and it makes any hero a tower taker. You can dominate the enemy catapult. You can dominate the enemy range creep just to tank the tower. You can dominate a wildkin for armor. You can dominate, you know... A uh, Hellbear Smasher for attack speed, uh, a Seder for the regen and the nukes. All kinds of creeps are so beneficial uh, in the early stages, and they're really fast. They're 425 move speed as well as 1400 health. I do believe this item will get nerfed, but it's also considerable to think that this item was such a big deal because in the past, your creeps would kind of get poked down, right? If somebody just took time to hit them as they were running across the map, 
they would die slowly. But if you have that creep around you, it gets the eight HP regen. So over time, it just doesn't die. And it's so powerful to having a creep that early in the game. And it also gives you stats, right? It's six all stats. So it's technically 26 attack speed, six damage, and sustain. Sustain for days is like really the main focus that I look at the item for. And so when people think like, isn't that mean it's a support item if it helps the team around you? And my answer is no, I think the item's so important that if you're a carry that wants to buy it or nobody else is gonna get it early enough, buy a damn Helm of the Dominator. It's kind of like a drums where you kind of want one, but in this patch, Helm of the Dominator is so good that you kind of need one. I think you need one on every team composition, no matter what. And so if you have somebody else that can buy it, yeah, pass it up on the carry and let them buy it. But if you think you're like fine buying it, and I think there's a lot of carries that it's a core item on, such as Luna, such as Ursa. I think you should just buy it every single game, unless it gets nerfed. But it's just an item that I think, once again, who benefits from this item, who can buy it? And that's a big change to the game. I know that sounds like such a, you know, it's just one item, but an item like that, you saw drums, you know, three patches ago where everybody picked it up, how game-breaking a single item can be. So the next one, and one of the biggest nerfs and changes in the game was Quelling Blade and Iron Talon. So they basically made it a flat amount of damage bonus instead of a percentage. And they also made it such that, you know, the Iron Talon cooldown is much more significant. So the biggest thing is what heroes relied on buying a Quelling Blade and which ones did. I really think this one could be gone into more depth, but I think it should be just left simply at that. Heroes that previously really needed a Quelling Blade, meaning like they had high stats and they had illusions or whatever that benefited from their Quelling Blade. Now, what heroes like, I, I, for instance, I don't think Ursa needs a Quelling Blade very much. I don't think Legion, who gets a lot of plus damage and builds stuff like Armlet and Phase Boots, and gets dual damage, doesn't really need a Quelling Blade. And heroes that rely on nukes to farm just get innately buffed by that. And heroes that bought a Quelling Blade and would keep it in their inventory until 30, 40 minutes are innately nerfed. So it's just like one of those things where I really want you guys to look at these changes and instead of looking at specific heroes with their talent trees, yes, that's relevant, but I want you to look more at what these specific changes do to every hero and the ones you have of interest. So the purpose of that first section of the video was to talk about my reasoning, right? I want you guys to understand why I'm going to tell you what heroes I believe are super strong in this patch. And I want you to understand that it's more than just like hypotheses. It's more than just, you know, an educated guess. I may be wrong about a few of these heroes, granted, because there's so many factors that go into this game. But after looking at everything I just said, um, I'm going to give you my interpretation of the heroes I play in the core role. I'm going to give brief information about other roles, but I'm going to primarily focus on the carry role. So when it comes to carry role, and you may be like, BSJ, these aren't carries, or not all of these are carries. And I'm going to answer to you is really think about what the carry role is, right? The carry role is meant to be farm prioritized in the side lanes, usually with supports, and their job is to scale into the late game of some sort. And that's obviously a very rudimentary description of carry, but you have to think of it as look how many changes are in this patch. Look at all of the dynamics that have just shifted completely. And now ask yourself, you know, should I probably stop thinking of the game the way I've thought about it for the last, you know, however many years you've played the game? Because the game is just so different now. So when I look at my carries, the first ones, I'm, I'm just going to go through, you know, from strength, agi to int, of I, what I believe are the strongest carries in the game. So the first one that I think benefited the most from this patch is Legion Commander. Uh, they gave her sick late game with her talent tree, at level 25. She's just got an overall solid talent tree. Her laning stage is insane. She benefits from the shrines incredibly so. Her strong dispel from her second ability is, you know, unmatchable, meaning like obviously there's other stuff that does it, such as Oracle ulti and Abaddon shield, but combining her with another hero that utilizes attack speed and wants to siege buildings, I think that she's just so strong as a counter initiator, and she's also getting given free damage from her talent tree, one of the things she lacked the most. So she was given everything that she lacked in her talent tree. She wasn't nerfed by any of the changes to the map. She's high mobility, so she benefits from bounty runes. She didn't clear camps very fast. She didn't like farm fest games. She wants to fight. I don't think you should treat Legion Commander as a solo pickoff hero anymore. Yeah, does she offer that, but that's the whole point is if there's somebody by themselves, yes, kill them. But she forces the enemy team to group up and you combine her with heroes on your team that just punish grouping, such as Undying, such as Warlock. Just pick her with heroes that just want to team fight. Is that hard to do in pubs? Yes. But there's only one way to shift the meta in pubs and, you know, alert people, wake them up to this patch. And I understand that this is going to be a little bit difficult to begin for everybody, you know, trying to play the carry role. 
but I figure somebody has to start, right? So Legion Commander, I think, is just incredibly strong. She benefits from everything in the patch and didn't get nerfed at all. So the next hero would be Slardar. Benefits heavily from the Shrine. High mobility around the map once again. Didn't clear camps. Benefits from the Bounty Runes. Loves fighting. Just absolutely loves fighting. And that's like all there is to it. He has a decent talent tree. And it, like all these heroes rely on a little bit of a decent laning stage. They do that laning stage well. And then you just run around killing people. And that's what I exactly think that the carry role is going to turn into in most games. So I just think Slardar's high mobility, Roche potential for almost any team, even though they buffed Roche's armor, as well as the fact that he can build so many different items that makes him effective, such as Helm of the Dominator if his team needs one, such as just like Tread's arm of Blink for the damage, such as like rushing a Blink in case your team needs initiation. There's just so many routes that Slardar can go to be effective, especially in a patch like this. The next hero I still believe is strong is Lifestealer. You know, he's more of a traditional carry, but it's because he, you know, he wants to get his items up. He has a strong laning stage, and once he gets, you know, phase armlet, you just run around the map killing people, uh, along with heroes that he can infest, such as a Slardar, if it's a Slardar offlane, or, you know, any other hero that just goes in. And I think that even though Lifestealer is more of a traditional carry, like I said, he is more of just an all-out brawler, and that's what the hero wants. He generally was weaker against illusion heroes, as well as high armor split pushers, and those heroes got nerfed. So when a hero, like, when a hero's counters got weaker that hero innately gets stronger so i think that he's much more situational because i believe that a hero like legion commander hard counters him for many reasons one because she has a bkb piercing disable as well as the fact that two in landing stage she can purge his open wounds his only kill potential so there's definitely heroes you have to worry about uh, as life stealer but you know as like he's a really solid third fourth fifth pick uh, in the patch because as long as he has a lane i believe he'll be super strong uh the next hero i look at is vengeful spirit you may be like bsj you know, Vengeful Spirit carry Ella Giggle. And I'll be like, guys, look at her talent tree. They gave her all stats, attack speed, damage, and Vengeance Aura damage. And just in case that wasn't enough, if it's a situational game where her magic immunity or where her missile could really use magic immune piercing spell immunity, then there you go. And I think that she's just gross because in so many ways that she's a strong laner if she has the right team comp, she gives her team a ton of damage. She loves just grouping, taking towers, taking objectives. And all she wants to do is fight, fight, fight. And I just love that. She's a perfect Helm of the Dominator carrier. I firmly believe Vengeful Spear will make her way into the meta as a carry hero. I just think all of her talent tree is incredible. I know I said the talent tree wasn't a huge deal for balancing, but certain heroes got amazing ones. I mean, I think that hers is one of the top 10 at least. So I definitely think you should be looking more to play her. She's a little weaker in the lane. So when you're playing a hero like that, I uh, really want to have a support. And once again, I think she benefits from the shrine as well. We're utilizing a couple of magic missiles as well as a wave of terror here and there and then shrining back up and going back in. So the next hero is Luna. As weird as it sounds, uh, Luna's a hero that did multiple things last patch. People think of her as like a Helm of the Dominator carrier from the previous patch, where she just stacked Ancients and farmed it. And what a lot of people neglect about her is the fact that she has an amazing aura for pushing. So I look at a hero like Luna, she's high move speed. She naturally wants to build the new Helm of the Dominator, give stats, regen, and attack speed. Exactly what Luna's love. And now you just max aura and you run around killing people. <laughs> Same idea. She benefits from a lot of the creeps as well from Helm of the Dominator. And she's just a really good grouping hero. 38 damage for all your heroes, you know, at level 9 is no joke. A lot of heroes that, that you know, supports especially, that previously hit for 55, 60 damage, now hit like trucks, you know, they hit for about 100. So I definitely think Luna is a hero that did multiple things correct last patch. And even though one of her aspects of her game got nerfed, which I still think she can kind of do once you take map control, she can still rapidly farm the map. But I think that her laning stage is very strong because of her aura as well as just, you know, her movement speed and the fact that she's a ranged hero. But also the fact that uh, she loves grouping and taking towers, taking objectives, and is like an amazing frontliner with an Aegis and all that stuff. And because of the fact that there's shrines and base and all that stuff, heroes like this that can, you know, promote safe sieging. You know, I mentioned it with Legion Commander being able to protect one of her siegers. I think a hero like Luna just is really good in the carry role this patch. Uh, the next hero that I've already talked about before in this video is Ursa, for all the reasons with the shrine. Loves running around killing people. That's what Ursa does well, was weak to the split push, was weak to those illusion carries. And all those heroes got nerfed, innately, you know, because of the changes to the game. Illusions giving gold, and, you know, Radiance not giving as much damage on illusions, all that stuff. Uh, heroes like Ursa really hated those games, and now you just kill people. And that's exactly what Ursa loves doing. He's a strong laner. He benefits even more from the shrine, so that makes him an even stronger laner. So as long as the hero has a lane, which I feel like is very easy to secure, Ursa, he also takes a Roche. And you may be like, but BSJ, you know, what do I need, like, Mask of Madness? Do I need Life Steal to take Roche? No, just get a Helm of the Dominator, dominate a creep, and tank the Roche for you. I think there's just so many things about this patch that benefit Ursa. So, 
Uh, those are really the main carries that I look at as strong. But, you know, I'll give a brief note that I believe Slark is very weak for all the reasons that, you know, I talked about are good this patch and the things that got nerfed. I think Slark relied on a lot of the things that got nerfed and doesn't benefit at all from the things that got buffed, for such as shrines and things like that. That's He's like my main hero that I'm kind of sad about. Uh, people are still picking him. I think it's going to just take a little bit of time before people realize, like, the enemy team groups up in 10 minutes, heroes like Slark just can't fight. Heroes like Morphling, heroes like Anti-Mage. The heroes, I, in my opinion, if your hero cannot fight before 15 minutes, you're just going to lose. Uh, that's what I believe about this patch. So you have to consider heroes like Weaver, heroes like Razor being much stronger because they just want to fight. Um, I didn't really, I'm not going to really go into depth of them yet because I'm not 100% sure. But I really think heroes that just want to fight, 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 no more farming uh, are the ones you're going to see in the carry roll this patch. So that being said, I definitely think that when it comes to supports, off lanes, and mids, I think the mid's going to be more of a carry role. I think mid's going to be heroes like Ember Spirit, one of the most OP heroes in this patch, in my opinion, because of all the changes to his talent tree, as well as none of the nerfs to mechanics of the game hurt him, um, as well as the fact that a hero like Shadow Fiend, uh, wants to group up, hit buildings, has a really good talent tree, just physical damage carries in the mid lane that don't rely on many items to come online, as well as heroes like DK in the mid lane, just heroes that want to group up uh, with a few items to just go. Uh, I think heroes like Sniper, like TA, have really good potential. I feel like heroes in the off lane want to be... Just strong laners that can go solo safe lane and get the arcanes, mech, and pipes, and all those useful items for their teams. A lot of heroes with diversity in that regard. Uh, heroes that I think of are Underlord, Abaddon, Darkseer. Those are the heroes I really think are going to be the strongest heroes in the, you know, quote unquote off lane, which I believe will turn into the safe lane. Uh, like off laners will be going safe lane. And then when it comes to supports, I really feel like your supports just need to do whatever your carry doesn't. If you have a objective taker like Luna, then your support should be like defensive or team fight oriented or pickoff oriented. If you have a hero like Ursa, then you should have a support like Leshrac or Jakiro, uh, heroes that really force objectives really hard with like virtually no items. Um, I think those heroes are going to be incredibly beneficial. Heroes like Visage, just objective takers, supports that offer forcing the issue. The last thing I think you want to be caught with this patch, which I've already seen in numerous pro games, is gaining a lead and not being able to close out the game because you just don't have the heroes to do it. And I think it's all about safe sieging, supports that can force objectives, and that's how games are gonna end, and teams are just gonna group up. There's so many strong group up items now. Pipe's been buffed over the last like five patches. Helm of the Dominator is an insane item this patch. You have Mech, you have Greaves. I just think there's so many good group up items that eventually people are gonna realize if you start five man shoving it down their throat, there's just gonna be nothing to do about it. And I'm sorry for all you farmers out there. Believe me, if you watch my stream at all, you will understand I am all about efficiency and all about trying to get as much off the map as possible. But the fact is, the reality is, there's just not as much on the map anymore. But all the objectives are still there. So when it comes down to it, the only way you're gonna get a lead is if you take the objectives, seize map control, and then all the resources on the map are primarily yours, right? There's less resources, so instead of trying to share them and flash farm them to get you know, an advantage with heroes that go late game, you have to have heroes that snowball from the early game, take map control, take objectives, and then can farm the map afterwards. And it's just all the heroes I listed above. And I believe this is like, that's pretty much my meta breakdown of the patch so far. And obviously I'm going to give updates if I believe they're significant, meaning like anytime I see something that changes or a new hero that I didn't think about, um, I'll be going into that and I'll be releasing hero specific guides in the near future uh, once I feel confident that like that the patch is like settled in and I can give a very solid advice on every hero, especially the core ones that I believe I will be playing. So just to, you know, kind of just one last tip is that I will be, that I, I perm, like my three heroes this patch are Ursa, Slardar, and Legion Commander and you know fourth like close fourth being luna i think those are the four heroes that i'm going to be spamming to win mmr i think those heroes are so strong i'm going to be playing them offline with the support and that's how i believe is the best way to gain mmr so yeah, i hope you enjoyed this video i know this is like kind of groundbreaking and it may not be the easiest thing to execute in pubs trust me i get it but once again there's only one way to raise awareness on the issue that is at hand people are kind of stuck in the past i'm even seeing in pro teams that I believe are very high skill teams that just aren't changing their strategies at all. So much of the game has changed, time for us to change as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the meta breakdown and feel free to post any questions, especially in the comments or the forums so that I can respond to what you guys are concerned about because, you know, there's definitely things I didn't consider. Thanks for watching this and I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll check out my other guides on Game League.